Remember the walls that we call sin and shame They were like prisons we couldn't escape And he came and he, and he rose Remember those giants we call death and grave they were the mountains stood in our way, but he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away, things so weak that we could barely pray, but he heard every word. Every whisper. And now those altars in the wilderness could tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail. He never will. But this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God, this is who he is, he saves us. For the cross, be the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus Who pulled me out of that pit He did, he did Who paid for all of our sin Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh Who gets the glory and praise Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Oh, nobody but Jesus is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let every man earth proclaim. This is our God. King Jesus. Cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Good morning, church. My name is Jeremiah. I'm the worship pastor here, and that's a new song that some of you might know, you might heard on the radio, but we just feel that that is a song that is worth singing as we gather as a family. As we come in these doors into this room this morning, we're coming to worship and we're coming to learn and we're coming to lift our voices in praise for who God is and who he calls us to be. We believe that church? Oh, come on. Do we believe that church? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to keep singing. We're going to keep lifting up our, our voices in praise and um, taking the time to remember Jesus, taking the time to remember the cross, and taking the time to remember that we are forgiven and that there is a grace that is offered to us through the death and resurrection of Christ that is so overwhelming and so amazing, something that we don't have to work for that we are made clean and that we have a new life. 
So keep singing, keep standing as we sing. Let's lift our voices as we sing, Man of Sorrows. Man of Sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own Jesus. Sin of man and wrath of God, this man on Jesus' name. Sing silent as he stood accused. Silent as he stood accused. Beaten, mocked, and scorned. Bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown. Sing all the rugged cross, all the rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. And now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor. church let's sing this in victory
Jesus, He came to love, heal and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because He that river I'll fight life's fire no war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights of glory and I know he reigns because he
That is, that is a sound of praise. Our voices collectively coming together. No matter what your background, no matter where you're from, no matter what you're struggling with, we stand here because he lived. We stand here because he died and he rose again. And that resurrection gives us life through the grace that's bestowed upon us. Right, church? Yeah. Yeah. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful opportunity to be able to gather together as family. And lift up your name in praise. Father, I pray as we continue throughout this morning that uh, you just continue to smile upon us. May you open up our hearts and our minds and our souls for what you have through your word this morning. And we know that you not only celebrate, but you also grieve with us. And so, Father, we, we just, it's such a privilege to be able to sit with you this morning with brothers and sisters, with your family, the church. We love you. And all God's people said, amen. Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Before you take a seat, turn to someone and say hello. Well, good morning, church family. It's so good to be with you and worship with you this morning. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Kyle Isabelli. I'm the senior pastor here at Avenue and just so glad that you've joined us this morning. Lots of exciting things that will be happening today as well as throughout the week. And um, we'll highlight those in a second, but just want to welcome you. Those that are gathering online uh, with us today, welcome. We're so glad that you're with us. Let us know in the chat uh, where you're gathering at today. And here in person, we ask every week that you grab that uh, Connect card, which is in the seat back in front of you. On that, it has some QR codes that you can scan that take you to our website that get you the latest information as to what's happening in the life of our church, how you can take that next step to get connected, so on and so forth. At the bottom of that uh, Connect card is a tear-off portion. We'd love for you to fill that out. At the end of the service, feel free to drop it off in the white offering boxes in the back of our auditorium. On the back side of that is also a place where you can submit any prayer requests that you have. We would love to pray for you, not only today, but pray for you this week. And so whatever is on your heart, we want to consistently come alongside you, church family, and pray for you, whatever the Lord's laying on your heart to, to be prayed for today. Well, I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward as we collect our tithes and offerings for today. Uh, there are various ways that um, our church family gives back here to the church, whether it's online, through the mail, here in person. And we as a church, we give primarily because it's an act of worship to God. It's to thank him and praise him for his blessings in our life. And it's a way to honor him in saying, you're the one that provides it all. And so you've shown us how we can worship and honor you by giving back to you. So we're grateful for your generosity and grateful for this time of worship to give. And as the, the baskets are being collected, just want to let you in on a couple of announcements happening in the life of our church. Um, the first one is tonight. Uh, we have our family ministry cookout. This is for all families, anyone, uh, one-person family, 45-person family, anyone can come out. Uh, we're having a cookout tonight here uh, on the patio by the student center. Feel free to come out, hang out. Uh, you can email Pastor Dan. His email is on that image on the screen. And let us know that you're coming to hang out with us tonight. It's just a great way to kind of end the year, kick off the summer. It feels like summer outside today, so we're grateful for that, right? It feels like summer. So that's a good thing. So we're, we're jumping into summer here today. So that's happening tonight. And the second announcement, um, anything that's happening this upcoming month, uh, we send out a weekly 
email. We'd love for you to get connected on that email. It has a list of everything that's happening. We have a next steps class coming up, which is for people who are new to the church and want to learn more about Avenue. We have our uh, camp chemistry VBS style summer event for our kids. We have our Ides meal pack. Where we'll be packing 40,000 meals and we have about a third of our volunteers that we need for that so far. So all that information you can find on our website, avenuechristian.com, or if you're here in person after the service today, head out to our info area in the foyer. All the information that you need is out there. You can talk to some of the people from our mission team and other people from our church, and they would love to help you take that next step to get connected here at Avenue. Well, I'm excited for this morning because we are this Sunday, as well as next Sunday, have some child dedications that we're really excited about. So we're going to invite the families to the stage here. And child dedication is an opportunity for the families here at Avenue to come before you, church family, and declare that they are going to raise their child in a way that points them to Jesus Christ, that points them to a place of where they can make that decision on their own to trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So you guys, I'll get out of the way. You guys can actually step down right here. I'll get out of the way for you guys. And so our family pastor, Pastor Dan, his wife, Melissa, are going to be leading this child dedication process, introducing to the families that we have on stage, and then I'll come up and give us a challenge because it's a responsibility for us as a church to support them in their journey of raising these little ones. So I'll get out of the way, let you guys take it from here. We are just so excited for the opportunity we have this week and next week and continue to have in our church. If you've been down our children's ministry hallway, it continues to get more and more jam-packed. We thank you for your patience as you go through the hallways because so many new young families are coming to our church, including families that are having children or have just had children. So our nursery is continuing to be packed full of young lives. We we're so excited for that. As Kyle mentioned, this is a special moment for the life of our church, but also a special life for who we are. We follow the example of Mary and Joseph when they took baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. We do that as an opportunity to say, this is our spot. This is our time as parents to say, we are going to start the journey now, even with little ones, and work our way through the rest of our lives. We want to dedicate ourselves, our family, but also dedicate ourselves to you as the family of Christ to be a part and invite you in to partner with us. And that's why this morning and next week is going to be so very special for what we're doing here this morning. Well, I get the opportunity to introduce you to these lovely families. The first family right down here, their little guy, he's waving at everyone. Um, they are Ross and Shanae Williams, and their little guy, his name is Blake. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. They have chosen Jeremiah 29, 11 as their verse of dedication, their verse to pray over and to use as part of their idea of what they want to do as a family of God is this. For I, the pl I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And that is what we absolutely hope for, for the life of Blake and his family. The next family that I get to introduce to you is Brian and Lauren McIntosh, and Lance is their little guy, and then his brother is here with them too. We're so happy to have both of these families as part of the children's ministry. <laughs> they, they have chosen Proverbs 22.6 says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and then when he's old, he will not depart from it. And once again, we, we pray that verse over the family, but also for Lance, that he is trained up in the way he should go. Pastor, how won't you join us as we time, take some time together as a church? Awesome. So I'm, for you parents, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and um, it's just declaring your desire to raise your kids in this way, and so you can respond after these three different sentences by saying, we do. And then church family will have the same opportunity to do that as well. So parents, do you accept responsibility as your child's primary faith influencer to impress the truth and the love of God on him as you live life together? If so, say we do. And do you pledge before God and give him your word that you will do your very best to raise your children to be followers of Jesus Christ? 
And do you agree to nurture your children in their faith by teaching the Bible at home, praying for them, and being involved in a local church where you and your children can further grow in your faith? Awesome. And church family, these are for you, and you'll answer by responding with we do. Do you, church family, commit to live your life in such a way to show these children and families a model of what it means to live for Jesus? We do. And do you pledge to love and supportively encourage these parents as they raise these children to become followers of Jesus? We do. Someone not painted? No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> well, what I want you to do now is I want you to extend your hand as a way of just praying over these families right now. I'm going to pray this verse, Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 26. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless my people. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Jesus, that is our prayer for the Williams and the McIntoshes today. Lord, would you give them the strength to live this out, Lord? Would you help us as a church to support them? We love you, Jesus. We praise you for these little guys, and, and I'm excited to see them come to that place of knowing and trusting you as their Lord and Savior. We love you, and we give you all the praise. And all who agree with this prayer, say amen. 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 Can we get up for these families one more time? <laughs> he put you down, yeah. You want to walk? Are you? No, he wants the keys. He's like, I got this. He's dedicated now, so he's like, I can walk off stage like a big kid. So he's good. I love it. Uh, we're, we're excited. We're excited. And, and like I said, we have two more next week as well. And so if you're around for that Memorial Day weekend, uh, make sure you join us as we get to dedicate two more, uh, have two more families dedicate their little ones to the Lord. Well, I'm excited this morning. Uh, as I said, we are full on summer here at Avenue. Um, we're having a summer cookout, and today we start a, our summer sermon series through the book of Proverbs called Fool Proof. And uh, before we jump into that sermon and before uh, our family pastor, Pastor Dan, will be delivering the word this morning, uh, turn your attention to the screens and take a look at this video. I was a nerd. Middle school into high school, I was an absolute nerd. And for some of you in the room, you're kind of confused. I can see some of you are like, I don't believe it. Some of you are like, I, I can see that. And for some of you, you're saying, uh, especially my family down here, saying, what, what do you mean past tense was a nerd? <laughs> um, but I was. I mean, I was, I grew about five to six inches between middle school and high school. I was tall, I was lanky, I was about this height, but about 110 pounds. My mom and I were trying to figure out how to keep up with my clothes, so I had short pants, floppy skater hair, bad glasses that are often, were often broke. And um, <laughs> my friends had this amazing, this amazing nickname for me. It was Urkel. Yes, yes, my, um, I say friends, friends, uh, said, <laughs> called me Urkel. See, the problem is, here's the problem, is while I looked the part of a nerd, I did not have the grades to match. Um, I was a skater, I played soccer, I played basketball. I looked the part of a nerd, but I did not have the intelligence or the smarts to match up. So while I benefited from all of the mocking of being a nerd, I did not actually get to benefit from the grade point average uh, with that as well. I think that's kind of a, a good connection for us because I think for us, over so we get into this time in the summer as we talk to the, talk to the book of Proverbs, I think there's a lot of us that spiritually are in the same way. We look the part of Christian, we look the part of person of God, but we don't have the intelligence, knowledge, or wisdom to match up. Well, we, we look to everyone outwardly, that we are those people of God, we don't have the spiritual GPA to match up. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to spend about 10 to 12 weeks this summer walking through the book of Proverbs, talking about what it looks like, according to God, to be smart, to be intelligent, to have wisdom and not look like a fool. So if you would grab your Bible in your seat front, grab your, open your phone, we're going to look at Proverbs, we're going to start in chapter one. As you're turning there, I'm just going to pray over God's word in the next couple moments. God, we thank you for this divine moment to begin to look into your word, to look into what you have given us as a wisdom book, a collection of places that we can look and find your wisdom, not just your instructions, God, not just knowledge, but how to live this life looking like you've called us to look, but also acting and living and thinking the way you've called us to act. Be with us this morning and the next couple weeks as we walk through this amazing book. In Jesus' name, amen. I call this morning, very simply, seeing your foolishness. Seeing your foolishness. We're going to start in Proverbs chapter 1, we're looking at 1 to 7. We're just going to park in just the first seven verses of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1 starts this way. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. What we have is we have an author. Solomon, probably one of the wisest men of his time, maybe the wisest person ever to live, is writing to his nation, but also to the young people of his nation as well. I spent a lot of time over the last almost 30 years working with students, working with families. And people ask me, like, what, what is the favorite thing? What is the go-to spot to teach the next generation? And I say all the time, Proverbs. In fact, Mitch and myself and our volunteer team will be looking through the book of Proverbs as well in middle school on Sunday mornings in the next couple of weeks as well. Because Proverbs contains so much wisdom, common sense, knowledge. But it's so creative in what Solomon does. So we have Solomon, the son of David. We know David. Solomon is the collector of this wisdom. He writes a lot of it. He collects it from a few other, other kings as well, some other people of his time. But he puts together this proverb. And the word here is, is this parallel or comparison to similar things or different things. What he does is he puts together a book to help us understand the difference between foolishness and wisdom. And he kind of does some comparisons throughout. The first nine chapters is just convincing us of wisdom. Convincing us that we need to not only look the part, but act and think the part. So he spends one to nine, the first chapters, first nine chapters is all about what is wisdom, how to get wisdom, why we need to have wisdom, and convincing us and the readers of the time to be wise. From verses chapter 10 to 31, he then has the collection of short proverbs. Small little snippets of wisdom, comparisons, some humor to help us understand how to live wise, but just give us some helpful hints on what he has to say. This is a part of the wisdom books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon, even Job is considered wisdom books. This is not historical. This is not an epistle. This is wisdom. This is poetic. So as we read it, sometimes we have to make sure that we're not taking it literal, but we're taking the wisdom that's being illustrated in this. So we have that for the whole entire summer, we're going to spend some time in some really important parts of Proverbs talking through this idea. So for this morning, I want to break down the final couple verses to just start off the book in three sections. I think it's very helpful for us to understand how to get to the point of wisdom the first one is understanding instruction leads to understanding. Instruction leads to understanding. This is the moment in the school year, middle school, high school, college, maybe late elementary, we are being tested. Your, your child, your student is being tested. They've been instructed all year, and now they get the big final exam to figure out if they actually understand anything they were taught. Do they have the grades to match up? Do they understand the year's worth of instruction? And the same thing here is we understand this as we look through the, first two, the second two verses. It says this, For the gaining of wisdom and instruction, 
for the understanding of words of insight, for receiving instructions in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair. What we have is we have the ability to gain something, we begin to collect. So over the summer, we begin to collect, gain some insight, gain some things, begin to understand some things. So gaining of wisdom and instruction. The word here is actually the word discipline and correction. Discipline and correction. Correct instruction involves some correction and some discipline. We don't like this part because we like to do what we like to do. We like to live in our own understanding. We like to live in our own instruction. We have our own idea of what truth is. And God says, no, 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 that's not how this works. Full godly instruction involves some discipline and some instruction. For the understanding of words of insight, the word here is discernment. For receiving instructions in prudence, that's the application of instruction that leads to wisdom, behavior, doing what is right, or some translations will say use the word, use the word righteousness. Righteousness, not self-righteousness, but understanding what it looks like for us to live right with God and with others. As we look at the book of Proverbs, it begins to talk to us about how we do life, not just between us and God, but how we apply that to the way we interact with the world around us, when we interact with our families, how we take in and learn and also in just, or the word justice, good judgment. Immediately be trying to add on social justice. Social justice is that outward idea, like that's not fair for them. But it starts with us. If we're going to learn and begin to understand the world, we need to understand and learn what God has for us. Good judgment. Why is there injustice in the world? Why is there social injustice in the world? It's because people of God are not living good judgment lives. They're making bad judgment calls. They're not applying God's instructions, and they just don't understand. So that's why this verse is so very important for us to understand, and it wraps up with this idea of fairness. The best way to translate this is to smooth and to straighten out. Fairness is this idea of taking what is bumpy, what doesn't seem right, and learning how to make it's smooth and correct again. <laughs> Instruction should lead to understanding. Just like our students right now, they've spent this year learning a lot of stuff, and now they're being tested on what they understand and if they don't understand. It's an it's a assessment of their learning. So often, we have this moment so what I want you to understand is, is we have a pair of glasses. Instruction leads to the framework of understanding. In order for our understanding to be a part of our, what we see in our world, we need instruction that leads to a view of understanding of our world. Here's another proverb we're going to probably look at a little bit later on, but it says this, Proverbs 4, 1 and 2, talking to a son about his parental instruction. It says, listen, my son, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teachings. Solomon talks a lot to the young people, young man, young woman. He talks a lot about the importance of mom and dad being a part of the instruction process. Son, daughter, listen to your mother and father. Do not forsake what they're saying. If you want to understand the world, listen to what the older generation is teaching you, young person. But for us who are older, make sure that we are also listening in and having the opportunities to take our instruction, our understanding, and passing it on. Proverbs is Solomon, an old wise king, passing on his instruction so that we can see with understanding, so we don't end up looking foolish in our world. You hear a lot about the fool in the book of Proverbs. The second part, the second step in us becoming smarter, more intelligent, God people, 
is understanding that we need to have knowledge. Instruction leads to understanding. Instruction leads to knowledge. Knowledge equals discretion. What do you know that allows you to learn how to discretion, discretionary choose, make discerning decisions? Verses four and five says this. For giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young, let the wise listen and hear and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. Knowing leads to discernment. Our knowledge, the facts that we learn give us opportunities to make intelligent, discerning choices. Proverbs is for the giving of prudence. It's this shrewd decisions. We look, think about some of this shrewdness and we think kind of like as kind of a shady kind of way for someone's going to rip you off. It's, no, this is, this is shrewdness in a godly way. It's saying, look, I'm going to look at the world around me and I'm going to make sure that I am making the wisest, most discerning, shrewd decisions that honor God because I know better. It goes on, for those who are simple. Lots of people read the book of Proverbs and think of the simple-minded. We're like, oh, simple, that's, that's kind of an idiot. That's someone who doesn't get it. The word actually here is, is this word, and we don't, as you read through Proverbs, when you hear the word simple, it's willing to be open-minded. Not trying to be complicated, not trying to be self-over-educated, not trying to be full of themselves things. I mean, I, I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to learn. I'm still open. Something that, that is, a, is a mantra for myself and for our team is leaders are learners. In order for us to lead well, we need to always be learning. And the simple, this verse here is simply saying, I am willing to be open-minded to knowledge. <laughs> I love this, all right? Knowledge here is a root word. We take the root word back to a Hebrew word, yada. Any Seinfeld fans in the room? Yada, yada, yada. Right? So in Seinfeld, we have a whole entire episode dedicated to yada, yada, yada. It's the word no. They tell a story, if you have, don't know Seinfeld at all, and they stop the story and just complete the story by saying yada, yada, yada. Fill in the blanks. You know, you know, you know. That's what we have here. We have knowledge, yada, 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 that fills in the blanks. You know you know, you know. We as God's people should know. The knowledge is, well, you know. We're talking to other people who get it too. We're like, oh, you know what I'm talking about. They're like, absolutely. I've read the book of Proverbs. I'm in, involved in the instruction, the knowledge of God. Yeah, I yada. I know. Knowing full well, discerning with a purpose. So the young person and also the learned sage, the wise, can also increase in their taking in of learning and let the discerning get guidance. No matter how old or how young you are, whether you're a young person or a wise sage, you can still increase more of your knowledge of God and his word. You can still find people wiser than you that can add to your instruction, add to your knowledge you can get more guidance. You can find more wise counselors. You look at the book of Proverbs. You see, get counselors, get mentors, increase. Don't stop learning. Get instruction, add to your knowledge, and allow that knowledge to change you so you're making discerning, wise choices. Let me cross references really quick with another proverb few verses, or a few chapters later, Proverbs uh, 8, 12 to 13. Solomon loves to personify wisdom, but he also likes to make it personal. He says this, I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion to fear the Lord, to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. See, wisdom 
lives in the same house as Prudence. They dwell together. And in that house, they possess knowledge and discretion. But it comes out of this fear of the Lord that hates evil. See, out of this is not a puffed up moment. It's the understanding of hating pride. The more you know, the less you know. The more you know of God, the more you realize about yourself and realize that you are not all of that and that you should shun and hide from pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. See, once again, we have a framework to look at in our world. Understanding and knowledge. Knowledge looks out in our world and has discretion. See, we understand and we have discretion. It forms together and it shapes around us. And they, they join together, like by fun tape. They hold the pieces together. But here's my problem with my glasses. They have no lenses. I took my lenses out. If I put them in, I probably wouldn't be able to see you. But also it's very important for us to understand in the framework. As we look at ourselves, we look at our world, that we see how foolish we are. The more we know of God, the more we realize that we are not him. That we have something in us that connects to who he is. And there should be a desire, a, a hunger. Solomon was one of those guys that was so hungry for knowledge and instruction. He spent his life learning, and then complimenting his learning, putting it all together for us to be able to read. Why did he do it? Because he wanted to change his nation. He wanted to change the next generation of his country. He wanted to be a wise king that even after he was gone, there was a generation of people who understood God and feared God and had respect for God, and it came out of their understanding of who he is. That's why I think the last couple of verses are so important. The last thing I want you to understand is wisdom equals fearful respect. Our instruction leads to understanding, our knowledge leads to discretion. The lenses that we look at are wisdom and fearful respect. We become wise when the frame forms around our spiritual eyes and we begin to fill in with wisdom and fearful respect. The last two verses in our section this morning, it says this, for the understanding of proverbs and parables, the saying riddles of the wise, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, of knowledge, of understanding. For the full comprehension of the Proverbs you're about to read, the parallels, the comparisons, he sets this up and says, all right, I want you to, to get wise. I'm going to spend nine chapters talking about how to get wise, why you should be wise, but then I'm going to give you some opportunities to begin to discern and to walk through the Proverbs and the parables. See, parables here is not always what we think of when we think of Jesus, but it is compared. See, it's oftentimes we, we get very serious with the Bible. We should take it very serious and respectful, but we need to understand it in context of Jewish culture and humor. The word parable is actually connected to the word satire or slight <laughs> cutting humor. As we watch and we read the parables, we read the parables that are Proverbs. In, in the book, you realize that there is some funny moments. We get we're very deep about it. But some of it is just plain funny. Solomon is poking fun at us and saying, you're foolish if. I mean, there's moments where a husband is living on, the, on this rooftop of his house because his wife is a nag. Eh. 
He's, t- he's, he's like, come on. He's talking about a dog going back to the vomit. And he's talking about eating gravel. It's satire. But in it, he is putting a message of wisdom. He's trying to get your attention. He's saying, look, this is silly, but here's the truth in it. There is a parable and there's sayings and riddles. He says, also, I'm going to put some perplexing questions in here. I'm going to put some things in here that are going to challenge you to think. I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm going to let you think about it. Saul was was a wise man. He loved having these moments of, of deep thought and of riddles. He says this, but of the wise, I want you to have fear. Fear here is, is not afraid. It's respect. Understanding that God deserves our respect. So when we, we think of the fear, we think, oh no, God's going to get us. And yeah, there is an element of this that we need to understand. My kids have fear of me. And you're freaking out. You're like, oh no, Dan is a mean, nasty dad. No, we set up respect in our home. We set up respect in our spiritual lives. We set up respect in our church life. My kids, I want them to know that I want the best for them. But I will have moments where I smooth out the the problems. There's moments I'm going to correct and instruct them. I want them to be afraid of my disappointment. And that I've given them clear instructions about what is best for them and they miss it and they go the opposite direction. I do it because I love them and I want the best for them. I don't think my kids think I'm holy or reverent, but I want them to understand that there is a respect in our home, but in our relationship. If, I, if people ask me, like, let's be real. People ask me, like, what is the biggest issue with, with children, young people, the generation today? Like, what is, like, all the things are going on. I mean, you've worked with students all this, life, all, all this time, and you're working with students now, and you're, you're walking beside some of your staff. It's really easy. It's respect. We have not taught fear reverence and respect of anybody or anything. I'll just be honest. What's missing is our understanding of God. Once we understand God, there's no turning back. You have to be in reverent respect and awe of him. If you truly know him, and that means why you can look at yourself and be awed and amazed at how God he's created you. What happens is it changes everything else. Suddenly you're looking at other people with reverence and respect because they're the image of God. So you're looking around our world, you're seeing things that are reverent and like, all right, God, I I want to live with understanding of respect. And I especially want to live in respect of God's house, God's people, his word, his name. How often do we disrespect God's name in an average week? The people of Israel, that was a big deal. Going on, says this, for reverence and respect of Yahweh. Yahweh is literally a misspelling of the name of God because they were afraid that someone would slip up and use God's name in vain. Reverence and respect for the most powerful and honored name in all of Israel, Yahweh. Respect. That's where the beginning, the word there is head. That's where the beginning of the head turns into heart, turns into hands. When you start knowing God, your heart falls in love with him. You begin to respect him in your actions toward yourself and others change. And then you'll yada, you'll know. But fools despise the word their scorn, wisdom, and once again, correction and instruction. Let me bore you one last time with some Hebrew. The word there, fool, we're going to hear a lot about it in the book of Proverbs. Let me spell it for you. It's E-V hyphen E-E-L. Sound it out. The Hebrew word is very similar to a word we have for evil. 
It's not a direct translation, but I find it very interesting that the word fool in Hebrew sounds a whole lot like evil. That when we don't understand and know God, we don't allow our knowledge and instruction lead us to wisdom, that we end up with foolish Hebrew evil, evil, disrespect, and we miss out on what God has to say to us and to change our lives. Let me cross-reference it one last time, another a proverb, a few, few chapters later. The proverb that I, I spend a lot of time talking to our young people about over the years, it's one that Mitch and I were spent some time talking about this summer. It says this, very similar to what we just read, it says, instruct the wise and they will become wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom, knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of getting wiser. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We, we, we become smarter, wiser, when we build a framework that be fill, becomes filled in with respect and wisdom and our perspective, our view of the world around us changes. Let me break it down. I mean, make it simple. I mean, this is a lot. So I brought with me a metal fork. A metal fork. Let me explain instruction, knowledge, and wisdom for you this morning in the most simple possible way I can think of. For those of you who have mom and dad who hopefully love you and taught you well, you were told some very simple instructions, given some very simple knowledge about a metal fork. Then you went to school and you learned about electricity. You learned about how electricity is conducted through metal. And then you learned that electricity and metal can also be dangerous. The instructions from your parents, because you loved them and they loved you, was do not put the metal fork in an outlet. Instruction, you were told what not to do. You were given knowledge by your parents and then given more knowledge at school about what would happen if you put the metal fork in the outlet. Wisdom is not putting the metal fork in the outlet. But surprisingly, as a staff, as pastors, and over the years, with students and parents, I have people coming into my office shocked <laughs> by the fact that things aren't going well. And I said, tell me about your instruction. Tell me what you know. Were you wise in applying your knowledge and instruction to the situation and what happened? You got shocked by what happened. See, wisdom, knowledge, instruction work together. We have the tools in our hand as we look at God's word. We know what we should do. We know the dangers. We know what we should be living like. Quite simply, and I put it on the screen for us so we know this. You can write it down. You can snap it on your phone. You can just remember it. But I wanted to sum it up just simply with one statement as we close out. It says this. Instruction and knowledge may frame our lives without seeing our world through godly wisdom. We will still end up looking like a fool. How to foolproof your life is by letting instruction turn into understanding. Knowledge turn into discretion. Wisdom turn into reverent fear and respect. Let the framework that Proverbs offers, offers us over this summer fill in the view of our world. Allow us to live wisely 
and with honor and respect for what God is trying to teach us. My prayer for you over the next couple of weeks, next couple of months, is that well, this will be a summer that you foolproof your life, your family's life, your parenting, your home, and that you will see such amazing wisdom from God's word. And you will also see for yourself your own foolishness. And then begin to make choices that will change the way you live, yourself, your family, and the way you live in our world. God, we come before you with praise, adoration, and absolute respect. Thank you so much for a wise man like Solomon that filled chapter upon chapter with instructions and comedy and humor and, and moments of us, us seeing truly who we are but who we need to be. God, be with Avenue Christian Church. Allow us to walk out of this summer a group of wiser, more intelligent people that not only looked the part, but lived the part. Allow us to have the wisdom and intelligence that matches up with the name people of God. Christian. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. Well, thank you, Pastor Dan, for that message and that reminder that uh, our lived lives could be a testament to the transforming work of Christ in our own lives and in our hearts. You know, as we come to the table of communion today, I was challenged to think about what connection I would make between knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and the table of communion. The breaking of bread, remembering Christ's body broken for us on the cross, and the juice representing his blood spilled out for us. And you know, I thought about, I, could, I was like, you know what, I could talk about the history of the doctrine of the incarnation. I could, you know, get some early church writings, and I was like, I'll brush up on it. And, you know, it could be a good connection as we talk about the body of Christ, and we take the bread. And I'm sure it would have been just fine, but something wasn't really quitting, sitting quite well with me. And I was probably thinking about it up until the week of. And it wasn't coming together how I would have liked to. You know, I was thinking about this for like a month, and I'm looking at this page the week of. I'm like, it's not, it's just not quite there. But then the Lord, in his perfect timing... Uh, there was a guy who stopped by the church on Wednesday afternoon. He had uh, stopped by to, to charge his phone. And why he came by the church, in his words, he said, you can say what you want about Christians, but they're nice people. Way to go, Avenue Christian Church. That's you guys. And so he stopped by, charged his phone. We had a great conversation in which we talked about what he believes, his experience when he was in the Christian faith. You see, he had read the Bible front to back a handful of times. He engaged with Christian and non-Christian philosophers and psychologists, and he had known about a lot of things. It blew my mind. I was absolutely amazed. He was two years younger than me. He just finished uh, his second year of college. And so, my friend, if you're here today, we're glad you're here. Um, and, but as I left that conversation, there was a shift that happened in how I was thinking about the communion and the sacrament of communion and knowledge and wisdom and understanding. You see, because as I left that conversation, I was thinking about all the things we had talked about. We talked about knowledge, wisdom, the inerrancy of Scripture, creation, the human brain. And I was reminded that all the information and knowledge in the world still requires each of us to answer one question for ourselves. Who do we say Jesus is or who do you say Jesus is? As we come to the table of, our, of communion, it's our opportunity to sit, to pause, and to remember who Jesus is and what he's done. That Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. The bread of life, the light of the world, the good shepherd, the gate by which we enter. The sacrament of communion has a rich history and a variety of ways of participating in it. But what is at the heart of communion is that we remember who Jesus is and what he's done. When we take communion, scripture calls us to examine ourselves. To confess our sins and to remember the gospel message that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin is death, but the gracious, gracious gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So praise God that if we confess with our mouths Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So let's take the bread, remembering Christ's body broken for us on the cross. And the juice, remembering the blood of our Savior that washed us free from sin, 
that now allows us to stand before God on Judgment Day blameless because of Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for our time together today. We thank you for this beautiful world you have created, that all this beautiful creation did not occur by chance, but in your majesty and power you have set the stars in the sky and you know them by name. Even more so, Lord, we thank you for creating us fearfully and wonderfully made. Lord, we confess that we've broken your law and sin, but we thank you for sending your son Jesus and that while we were still sinners, you sent your son to die in our place. Lord, would you allow us to leave this place with an increased knowledge and understanding of who you are? Would you grow our fear and holy reverence of who you are? And would you grant us an eternal perspective that reminds us the gospel changes everything? We thank you for your son, Jesus, and we pray all of this in his mighty name. Amen. Thank you so much, Johnny. Such a very clear, uh, and Dan, too, for such a very clear uh, instruction of what we're supposed to do and who we're supposed to be uh, in remembering what Jesus has done for us. And we thought no better way to end this service than by singing a song that holds some words that some of us might call the Apostles' Creed, but it holds words that just says, this I believe, this I believe, this I believe. What a great way to end a service where we dedicated families and we've decided to come alongside and say this, we believe this so much that we're dedicating children to being raised in that way. So if you could stand as we sing.
declare these truths, the, the wisdom, the knowledge that we've received, and that what we've seen and what we learn is impacting how we live. Amen, church family? Amen, amen. Can we thank Pastor Dan for his word for us today? Thank you. Appreciate you, man. Such a great way to just, as you said, start the summer. This is where we're going. Just thank you for that encouragement. Um, and one thing I want you to know, a uh, guy who is leading our communion focus today, Johnny Karish, many of you know, he's our intern uh, with us this summer. A couple weeks ago, he was teaching our kids. But um, as we shared last week in our elder update, which if you didn't grab one, they're on the high boy tables on your way out. Uh, we're very excited that um, when Johnny finishes his internship with us in July, we'll let him get married in August. Just kidding. But starting in September, uh, Johnny will officially come on staff as our new children's director here at Avenue. And so we're really... Really excited to have Johnny on our team. Uh, Johnny has been at this church for many years. His fiance, Rena Cerny, also has been at this church for many years. And you'll see them a lot of times uh, in the kid work area. And we're just, we're grateful to have Johnny on our team. So uh, when you see him later today, uh, tell him that you like the lab coat better than the suit coat and uh, congratulate him for uh, just the work that God's doing in his life. Church family, love you so much. Thanks for joining us this morning. We have some deacons up front that would love to pray for you if you need someone to pray for you today. Have a great rest of your Sunday. You're dismissed.